said, I really am excited to announce our, our first speaker, uh, Dr. James Handler. You know, I've been you know, listening and at conferences hearing about this semantic web thing uh, for a number of years, and, and frankly, I didn't have much context for it initially. And one day I had this light bulb moment, and I said, oh, this has to do with making data more useful, largely for both algorithmic-based uh, investigation as well as ourselves. And uh, it just so happens that through the video technology industry that I occupy, I, I know Jim's brother, Bill, uh, who's with us today. And I remember just talking about metadata and things like that. And he goes, oh, you know, my brother is one of the co-inventors of the semantic web. And I was like, really? Because <laughs> it just so happens that I'm chairing a conference that gets into this subject quite a bit. So thank you, Bill. And, and thank you, James, for the work that you've done. Um, I look, look forward to hearing what you have to say about Semantic Web and where it's taking us and how it helps us serve these missions that we have, again, both for our own organizations and, and for the rest of time. Thank you. So it's not quite the same title as uh, in the uh, program, and that's mostly because I forgot completely what title I told them, and so <laughs> this, this has been happening more and more as, as, as the beard has been going grayer and grayer. So, um, but that's contact information and all that stuff, and a lot of talks I give are on um, the SlideShare platform, so if you want to see some of the other things, stuff. And um, so, so Nick was just talking about the future and all this AI stuff and things like that, and you know, when he was talking to me about, about the talk and stuff, we were getting all excited about that stuff. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that's not what I was going to talk about today. So I'm actually going to talk about archiving and metadata and sort of stuff about, you know, information content and really not about sort of the whole way AI is changing our world and things like that. So um, if you want to see my concepts about the other stuff, I've written a book on it. It's, it's, my publisher says I have to put this in every talk I give, so this was my subtle way of sneaking it in, and, and enough of that. So what I, um, what I thought I would do is show you sort of a variant of a, a project, something I do with my students when I start teaching this stuff. And I think you'll see it's a lot to do with the sort of way a lot of you are, are dealing with, with problems in the professional life of how we figure out what's in things, how we manage the assets, how we share, uh, exchange, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, what I do in the class is I tend to pick some person, event, thing that most of the students wouldn't have heard about. So today actually happens to be the, would have been the 60th birthday of a good friend of mine who uh, died 20 years ago. Okay, so supposing we wanted to find in your assets a good picture or video or something about him, right? Well, how would we do it? I mean, this is kind of the thing I suspect some of you, those of you who do the outward facing stuff, your phone rings and someone says, you got a picture of, of Jack Pressman, okay? And, uh, you know, in this case, I just want to make it clear, he, he, he died before Wikipedia existed, so he's not in there. Well, actually, a lot of people died, are in there. He wasn't famous enough for Wikipedia, or at least no one's got around to doing that yet. He never made it into a YouTube video. If you search on that name, you find a lot of people. Uh, I can't find any pictures of him when I just do standard image searches. So how would we go about doing that? Well, so that's kind of what I say to my class. What would you do? And I'm not going to do it as an interactive exercise today, uh, mostly in the interest of time, and also because I suspect most of you would be much better at it than I am. But uh, we would sort of say, what do we know about this guy? What can we learn about him? So, so I already told you it would have been his 60th birthday, so you could figure out when he was born, how old he was. You could ask me questions about things like, where did he grow up? Uh, where did he go to school? Did he have any major uh, accomplishments? And if we start probing those things, those start to give us the hints about where to look. So if you knew he went to a particular high school, so, so he went to Stuyvesant High School in the mid-70s. OK, there were a bunch of famous people who went to uh, they're certainly in the geeky science community, Eric Lander and people like that. So you might look for pictures of those guys to see, you know, or, or find their yearbook, which is probably there, and then he might be in that, and et cetera. Et cetera. So, so what you're looking for is, what stuff do I know about this thing I'm looking for that links it to other things, 
right? So, so it's that linking notion that's a lot of how, how we need to find things in archives, share things be, between archives, et cetera. But the problem is all of this stuff is going on in here, right? And the question is how do we get the computers both to organize the knowledge better, help us organize the knowledge better, help us exchange this kind of knowledge and sort of link this stuff together. So um, there's a ton of, uh, so when I prepared for this, I figured I should go find out what was going on out in the space of tools for um, uh, and it, you know, sort of, uh, archiving and uh, digital asset management and things like that. And I just found, I mean, that's like the first set of the first page of the images of, of tools. So I know you guys have a lot available. And I started, you know, sort of clicking on these one at a time to see what I could find. And, and I noticed something about them, which is there's some incredible technology there, but it's primarily inward focused, right? It's focused on sort of saying that, uh, hey, you know, take this video, take the soundtrack, take the, take the words coming out, do some stuff with that, say when and where, take this clip from here to here, put some metadata on it. But then it kind of builds it into a database that's internal and then use the same tool or, or, or a similar tool by the same vendor to kind of pull the stuff out. So it, it's very much managing your archive in most of these tools. And I know, I know there are some that are about going beyond that, but it's how do you put things in, find them, archive things. And it, it's very, and some of these tools are more aimed at the, the preservation side of archiving, but most of these are aimed at the, you've got that digital asset somewhere, it's got some identifier in the system, and this is putting information around it. So the metadata side of this stuff, the putting information side of it, is pretty straight, is being supported by these tools, but not in a way that's kind of outward facing. So, um, ah, if I hit that. So, so circa 2001, um, this article came out in Scientific American. Uh, it's, it's, it's famous under the name Berners-Lee et al, because the first author was Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, I'm et, and another colleague of mine is Al. We actually went to one of the first semantic web conferences, with badges which read et and al, and, and everybody knew what we were referring to. So. Um, but really what we outlined in here was a vision of what nowadays we would call linked and shareable metadata, right? And we had agents in there for finding and stuff like that. We used scary terms like ontology and things like that, which are now fairly common. But we were really talking about a very different vision of this stuff, not about kind of building hardcore logic things for the computer, but building things that would let people share, link together, point at each other's things, point at each other's concepts. So I'm going to do like the world's fastest introduction to the semantic web technology. And it's really, I mean, in a certain sense, very, very easy. So on the web, in its traditional form, and nowadays, of course, there's a million other things there, but it's really about links. So you got a thing, and it links to another thing. And the name of the link is pointer. I mean, it's just link, right? And so at some point, people started thinking, well, you know, what if we put labels on those links? And that was, not a, that was not a concept that, you know, sort of grew with the semantic web. In fact, there's papers back from 1992, 1993, really, really early days of the web, because people were already starting to think about issues of, you know, if I'm looking for gates, am I looking for a person or am I looking for something for my garden? Right? So what if we had 10 things? We had person and we had place and we had this. And people were su suggesting these little sets. And one of the ideas that came along, and this was sort of probably the biggest idea in the semantic web, was what if we had an arbitrary set of those labels? So just as we can have an arbitrary thing on our server that is something we look at, an arbitrary thing somewhere else in the world it points at, why not also have an arbitrary thing that describes that? And then we just need some way of, of sort of any of us can agree that we'll just use this, this particular terminology to be those links. And if someone else wants to buy in, they can use our terms. If they want to compete with us, they can do different terms. So that was basically the idea was that sort of, and then the key is, well, once you've got this idea that you can have these, um, these links labeled by those things, well, hey, you know, that's a document name, right? And we, the first guys doing this weren't thinking of that as a document name, but then we realized, well, have that document describe some stuff. So 
here's some page on some document and it's linking to these other things. And one of the things it could look link to is pages that describe some of those relationships. And in fact, the, the best thing about this was that you could do that. The worst thing about this was a lot of people got so fixated on those documents and what we put on them and what they describe and things like that, that that really became the center of attention. And people sort of started forgetting about the fact that what was really important was that you could link these things together because now I could take the way I was described in one place and the way I was described in another place and say, these are the same guy, right? And that's the linking concept, right? So now we can start doing the things we were talking about. Okay, he went to this high school. All right, let's find the stuff from that high school. He's, he shows, something is in this video. It links to this other video in some conceptual way. Same producer, same participant, same whatever. So, so a lot of that stuff got explored. This is a, a, a slide that started getting done, and I think the last time it was done was uh, uh, 2012 or 2013. So this is the 2010 version, because it's cleaner. But each of these bubbles represents some big set of data that someone put out there in this conceptual form and linked to one of the others. The one at the center called DBpedia has become very, very important in this world. It's basically Wikipedia now, every time you put a link in there, and particularly when you put them in those things off to the side, the, the little information boxes, it actually makes those available in a machine readable form using these syntaxes. So now what happens is if you want to get a whole bunch of information about a whole bunch of stuff really quick, you can just grab it out of Wikipedia and it points back to the Wikipedia pages. So, so what's nice about that is, is now you have this sort of metadata that's very rich and the real data, or at least the documents behind it. And so a lot of people have been playing with these ideas and it turns out that images were, in this, were, were one of the things that was suggested very, very early on in this. This is a slide I found. Uh, the slide was originally made somewhere around 2001, 2002. And it was talking about what we could do with the semantic web. So we could have these kind of definitional vocabularies that we could link to things in pictures. And we were actually talking not so much about the entire picture, but literally to the, the elements. So if I'm looking for a picture of this particular guy, by the way, I'm going to talk mostly about still images, mainly because I know a lot more about them than video. Um, I'll talk a little bit about video later. When we get to some of the new technologies, I'm going to switch over more that way. But my hope is that, that from people I've talked to, that the image metadata problem and the video metadata problem aren't that different when you're talking about these issues of sharing, finding, et cetera. So there's a lot of technical issues about how to identify a piece of a video, how do I, uh, you know, here, here I can point at this particular guy in this particular picture. Well, in a video he's moving around, may not be in every frame, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I'll, I'll allude to some of that later, but I'm gonna hand wave most of that away for, for uh, a while. So, so the idea was if you had information about these kind of things, so this was a little um, ontology or vocabulary about baseball, right? So now I'm looking at a baseball game and I have a player, and now I can get much richer because I can sort of say, okay, this guy is the outfielder or the infielder, and he's you know, on this team and, and that kind of thing. And, and this was sort of a simple idea. So if you had these vocabularies and you had these pictures, you could link the things in the pictures to these vocabularies, and then other things that were linked to the same vocabulary, that could be the model of how we share. So some tools started being built for that. These are some that, that my lab did. There were similar tools done at anything. So this was a, a system called PhotoStuff. First papers on it were in about 2005. It actually got used by NASA for some stuff. I'll show you in a second in 2007. But the idea is you could grab these vocabularies. So the idea was not, that you had this vocabulary of everything, that you would sort of go to that index, the, the ultimate thesaurus. It was that there'd be a lot of those out there. And so now you'd say, okay, you know, I wanna mark up this picture and I'm looking at some space stuff, so I go grab something from some site that has a lot of space information, and I grab you know, this and I click, okay, this thing that's uh, Europa is you know is a natural satellite and then when i click on natural satellite what i get is the properties that those things have in that in that vocabulary that i can then put against this one which can be descriptors pointers where it's located all that stuff some of that can be inherited a lot of lot of you know technology behind that to make it easier uh, and then we could do this for a lot of different things this was actually deployed for a while by nasa so it would automatically take these photo markups turn them into a website, and 
this was early enough that you could get away with websites like this. Um, but for example, this is uh, Story Musgrave, who's a particular um, shuttle astronaut, and there he is out in space, right? And you could also find things about what missions he was on. If you clicked on a mission, you would hear, see the information about the mission and the crew and all the pictures that went with that. If you clicked on the thing he's installing, as a, uh, I think was a Hubble update, so that will get you to the information about the Hubble, and you could actually get even down in, in their thing, all the way to the, um, a pointer down to the engineering diagrams behind the scenes of, of what that, doc, that thing was and stuff like that. So the idea was you could use vi these things for sharing, and, and, and people started taking some of that and extending it to um, video, video stuff, so being able to describe sort of something happening in a particular scene. So instead of just an object in an, an image, you could also talk about a scene in a video. So anything you could break into a piece, you could put metadata against that piece, and then you could describe it. And so this was um, actually originally posed as a challenge problem. Now, you, now search has gotten to where you can find a lot of these, but um, once upon a time, if you typed into Google, you know, the picture, the, the, the thing where the guy throws his hat at the statue and its head falls off, you would not find the James Bond movie. Now you do because somebody on Wikipedia said, hey, there's this really cool scene in Goldfinger where this happens, right? So again, until somebody puts the information in, the search can't get it from the words. It's got to have something conceptual. And even harder is something like, okay, you know, I'm looking for... Uh, this was actually somebody in Japan looking at George Bush commenting on the 9-11 uh, 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 tragedies. And, and so the question is, you know, how would I find this? And once I found, okay, you know, there was some story that NHK ran on it, how would I go to their archives and say, I want the stuff you were running on this time in this place, right? So again, you can, again, the same sort of metadata and stuff more at a technical level, but now I want to hook it to some, some of that concept. George Bush, 9-11, things like that. So again, the, the concept was to enrich the metadata stuff. We actually started looking at, at automating some of this, again, some of the um, technologies of the day for, for video tracking and video archiving. And uh, really, the, the problem wasn't so much the markup side of this. It was that the video technology was pretty weak. So you would try to track people through a video and it would, you know, the person would go off the scene and come back on again. The systems weren't very good at saying that's the same person or a different person. But on the other hand, this was actually, um, so as one of my colleagues was doing, this is a French bank and some guys are going into vault and they were trying to show that this was actually a bank robbery and uh, they were trying to reason about this stuff. But what was interesting is, is one of my students who was working on a completely different project, which was actually using this metadata stuff to support some government uh, work, said, hey, you know, I know that guy, right? That, that's uh, Nadir Adarif, who happens to be a terrorist, and the reason they were robbing this French bank was to actually make money for, for what we would now call terror attacks, right? So, so he knew who the guy was. So now he could sort of add that to the video, and it would actually flow to a website about the person and things like that. So, so we were keeping that central asset around the people or the places or things like that flowing to these things. Again, so the concept was there. Uh, other people have done other things. I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to show this one because uh, I was gonna say all these really nice things about someone named Laura Arroyo, but she's sitting here, so Laura Wave. Um, but, but she has been working for years with the Reich Museum and with, with other organizations, BBC and others, to really take some of these ideas and make them real. And really taking, building tools for curators, building tools for linking these things together, conceptually linking a lot of the different stuff in the museum across catalogs and things. So not find all the pictures by this guy, but how does this person relate to another person through some set of links, things like that. Uh, BBC, and again, Laura was very involved in some of this stuff, uh, has been putting a lot of this kind of uh, meta information on a lot of their stuff for a long time. One of the really big times they used it was in the 2012 Olympics. Uh, so keeping track of what events and who was in them and where they were going on. So you can see now suddenly that stuff we were sort of talking conceptually back in the baseball picture is really happening against actual things where these are the videos of, um, you know, broadcasts of these particular events and things like that. So, so how to do this stuff was not really 
at a conceptual level was not really the challenge. And building sort of prototype tools for this stuff was not really the challenge. So, so really a big part of the problem was a lot of these things were one-ofs and there wasn't a lot of back-end technology. But something else started to happen around 2011 and 2012, which is the semantic web stuff in a particular form started to get real. Right? These are just some of the companies that started making their stuff available at, um, in, in the semantic web markup. So again, in these enhanced metadata with these link things, and some of them were very simple. It was just, here's a descriptor, but if you want to grab those descriptors and say things about them somewhere else in a web-like way, you could. Some of them were really using these ontologies and rich things. And you can still, for most of these sites, they have some access somewhere for developers where you can grab the information that they're willing to share in these machine-readable forms, right? And, and so there were a lot of these things going on. A lot of these were companies that discovered it didn't cost much to, to sort of have the stuff exportable in this standard, and it was a nice standard, and lots of people were starting to use it. What really broke it open was this little company called Google who um, said, you know, this thing we do called search would be a lot better if there was a lot more of this stuff out there. So again, back to that, that thing I started the talk with, right? We're looking for this guy, and you know, we know some stuff about him, and we want to find him. So, so Google's like, you know, okay, if, if you type that search, and I know something about you, and I know something about the person, I know sort of these linkages, I can start to do, make the searches better, right? And why do I want to make the searches better? Because then I can sell more advertising, if I sell more advertising, Google can continue to be the biggest company on earth, or at least among the top 10. I think they're now third. Um, so they created this thing called the knowledge graph. Um, Facebook also did this through something called the open graph protocol. So, so if, you know, when people ask me, when are we going to see the semantic web? I used to get asked that a lot. I don't get asked as much anymore. Uh, mostly because people stop caring, I think, because, rather than they know it's there. But, but this thing called the knowledge graph has become the term that lots of people have heard. And if you're a technologist wandering around these spaces these days, you've probably heard about knowledge graph, knowledge vault, things like that. And what it really is is a whole lot of this linked stuff around entities. In, in uh, Google, it's entities related to search. In uh, Facebook, it's entities related to. So these represent people on Facebook, things that pay. So, so Facebook had a problem. They knew a whole lot about you because you told them. You said, hey, I'm male and I'm you know, this age and I this relationship status. And you know, people were just willingly giving them this stuff that was incredibly valuable information. The problem is they didn't know what was going on anywhere else. So when they started putting like buttons on other people's pages, the idea is when you click the like, they would know that you, who they knew a lot about, had liked this product, this movie, this other thing. Uh, and they started enhancing those like buttons. Now they actually have a vocabulary. So the company can say this person liked something, this person bought something, this person browsed something, which is why some of the Facebook advertising has gotten, quote, better, unquote. Uh, they get more return. Most, it frustrates more of us than it used to. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that. The day after I buy something, it starts showing up on my Facebook feed all the time. And I'm like, well, I don't want one anymore. I just bought it, right? And, and, and I actually went out to a bunch of people at Facebook and Google and stuff like that and asked them why it's happening, and that's a long digression. But it's roughly for business reasons, not to do with the technical aspects. Okay, so, so, so nowadays you see this semantic markup stuff every single time you do a search that has one of those boxes off to the side. Right? And those are getting more sophisticated. Now, now they're doing things like actually trying to answer questions and things like that. So um, one of my colleagues who was actually involved in the IBM Watson project, who's now at Google, you actually you know, was showing me that they've added things like, so if you say, you know, how tall was President Obama? Instead of it, it trying to find you a page that says that, it says, you know, President Obama is this, I, I forget, six foot something. Right? And, and then it links that to one of these kind of information boxes and things like that. Um, so, so you get a lot of this stuff that's pulled off to the side and it pulls it from lots of different places in something called the Google Knowledge Vault. 
right? So Google gets this by people putting some of this information on their pages in a machine-readable form. It's mostly through something called schema.org. If you know what that is, I don't have to tell you, and if you don't know what it is, don't worry about it unless you're doing stuff in search, in which case you have to learn what it is. But because it drastically improves the value of searches and stuff like that. But so Google has used that plus some other techniques I'll talk about in a minute to link together what, what's now reputed to be about five billion facts. And that's, those five billion are watching their sort of open system, right? And reportedly back in their kind of places where only they can get to, there's a lot more. And those are exactly the things that say, uh, Jim Hendler gave a talk at AMIA on such and such a day that uh, so and so was born in this place, that this guy plays for this sports team which is located in this city. So it's basically taking that, that data graph, putting labels on it and building a really big one, big thing of it and not trying to make it very detailed. So it's not saying here's everything you could say about a person and we're getting into all these details, but it's saying something like, hey, if somebody's an actor, you kind of want to know what things they were in. If somebody was an author, you want to know what they wrote. So as soon as you get one piece of this information, you can start sort of collecting the other from their search. Um, this is a slide that Peter Norvig, the, the director of research at uh, Google showed a talk he gave uh, about a year ago now. Was, but where, where are we now? A little more than a year ago. Um, no, this is, this is April. Yeah, a year ago. I'm thinking it's September. I don't know why. I'm, never mind. Um, they're using all these different things, right? So they're using what people have said. They're using uh, language extraction tools. They're using uh, probabilistic inference algorithms. What they really mean is machine learning. They're learning different kinds of things. But notice that one called human judgments, right? So, so this is where it gets back to you guys. Uh, so if we could just automate all of this and just, you know, we're going to watch the films and look at the images and we'll just build this stuff and, and magic will happen, I suspect a lot of people in the room would be unhappy because you feel like you're a big value add. And the answer is you are. So here's some examples. Google hasn't shared a lot of their mishaps, but Yahoo had a couple talks where they did. So, so here's three of my favorites. So this is Vin Diesel. Uh, Vin Diesel was born in July of 1967 in New York City. According to this, he died January 30th, 2014, but the, but the place is to be announced, right? Um, and, and, you know, this isn't quite right because actually he's still around. Uh, but, but it's even worse, just even if he had died, just saying, you know, well, somebody's going to tell us where later is a weird thought. Okay, so that, that one isn't so bad. This one's a little worse. Uh, hello? Not that one. This one first. This one first. All right. Damn. Ruined my punchline. Okay. <laughs> we'll get there. So Ice Cube. Lots of good metadata about Ice Cube. And then the definition. Ice Cube is a roughly cube shape, blah, blah, blah. Okay. That's when we're, we're just, the computer got confused about two things with the same name. This is the really big one, right? So this is Michelangelo, and you already laughed at it, but laugh again. Um, I have about an hour and a half talk I, I give about this one thing, so I'm not going to go into that detail today. But this is fascinating, because most of these systems are fed by the web. And if you actually analyze what's out there on the web, this is a much better picture of Michelangelo than anything else. Because it keeps showing up in the context of lots and lots of Renaissance artists. Michelangelo, Leonardo, Donatello, Raphael. They just keep showing up over and over again together. And we know they're all Renaissance artists. And here they keep being associated in this video and in this com comic book and in this, this movie. And I mean, they're just all over the place. I mean, this is a great Michelangelo. And it turns out there's very little of, of this kind of textual knowledge about the turtles. The textual knowledge is mostly about the artist. Right? So you've got the image archivists, the people from the Reich Museum, who've been putting out all this great information about the Rembrandts and, and people like that, and these other ones in Europe who've been putting out all these Renaissance artists. And now you've got this, this web that's full of the information about when they were born and where they lived and what their famous pictures were. And then you've got this other video stuff that, that's associating them with the wrong ones. Right? So it's not just a naming confusion, it's a much deeper confusion than that. So 
And, and, and it really gets at the root of where a lot of the problems are. So, so switching from sort of the history of semantic web, what it could be doing for us, et cetera, why aren't we seeing more of it? Why is it that those tools are still mostly inward facing, right? And I think there's really two important reasons for that. There's, there's more, but these are the only two I have time to talk about. Um, so most of this is still experimental in the archiving community. Most of this is still one ofs The BBC stuff is all over the place, but it's never really made a market, right? There have been a lot of cool demos done from it. A lot of researchers have got research funding to show what's possible, but it's not in the tools that folks like you use from day to day or help build for people to use day to day. And, and there's really a couple different um, impediments. One is simply the high cost of doing this annotation. Right? So again, if I have to look frame by frame or, or picture by picture through something and say, okay, this is a person and this is a this and this is this and the person is picking this up and things like that, gets really complicated, especially when there's multiple vocabularies back there. Things like that. So problem number one has been that high cost. The second thing is what do you do with this stuff? So again, the, the value is mostly to other people that you've done that. Now, as this stuff becomes a market, we were talking to some people in sports who do want to be able to call someone up and say, hey, have you got any picture of this? And I want it now during the commercial, right? So uh, something you're going to search for a week to get me a really cool thing isn't very helpful. So, so getting that kind of linking going is something a lot of people are talking about. But the trick is, for any given system, for any one example, you can build a custom system. Question is, how do you get a bunch of people to want this and want to make it happen? the way we do a standardization thing, but now they all have to invest a little bit in some tooling and things like that, and that's been a hard business problem. But these other impediments have more to do with sort of the other thing. So, so why should I spend my time built, putting in information in something so other people can get value? They can reuse my stuff, unless they're gonna pay me, but then that gets us into, into those economic issues. Well, one of the things that people are starting to explore, and I'll just tickle this very lightly in the last slide or two, is actually can we can we sort of go beyond search? Can we start doing some other stuff with that? So, so my last few slides, so, so the big breakthrough, the reason you've been hearing a lot about artificial intelligence these days comes because of this stuff in machine learning, big data. A lot of it grew out of that advertising match stuff. Uh, Nick asked me, you know, would I please talk about the fact that you're all a number in some big, you know, now that I know you're a, a cyberpunk fan, I could have... I got my Gibson collection. <laughs> um, me too. <laughs> but, um, but this stuff is real. So what happens is, this is, I mean, there's a lot of different slides that look like that. There was this thing called ImageNet, which is an image database organized according to WordNet, which is sort of a, a thesaurus kind of vocabulary. And I'll, I'll show you a couple, uh, one screen dump from that a little later. But what happens is you show a picture to someone and you say, what is that a picture of based on the things in this uh, thing And um, if you actually took these things and you had a bunch of people put them together and say, this is what's in the images, and then you would show it to a person and, you know, a bunch of people and say, what's in these images, they'd get about 95%, right? Again, some of these are slightly obscured, some of these are, are, are a little ambiguous, so that's not surprising. Uh, if you gave it in 2010 to a um, computer you were lucky if it got 70 or 75% of them correct, okay? About 2014, you hit, you hit uh, I'm sorry, 2013, you hit a knee in the curve. And by 2014, these things were outperforming humans and they continue to get better. So now just pure, this is a picture, what is it? Is it a duck, is it a cat? The computer beats, the computer's got that nailed using these technologies. And now what people are trying to do is take them further. Can we actually do the kind of things we were talking about? Can we say what's in the image? Can we answer questions about the image? Can we, um, can, can we say what's happening in the image? And also, a lot of people are going into video. The real problem with video in these mostly is just the scale effect, right? So eat, just learning a bunch of images takes a lot of computer power learning a bunch of videos, which are each a bunch of images from the point of view of the computer, takes much longer. And so people have been looking at new ways of representing stuff. But um, so, 
So these are kind of what you see. So, so you'd show it a picture and it's able to sort of label the different things in the picture. So that's a bird and a frog and a person and a dog and chairs and things like that. And they actually do pretty well. Um, there's a lot of interesting errors they make and things like that. I'm not going to go into that. That's where a lot of the technology drivers are. Uh, this mixing of word and text is very new and it's doing good in some ways and not in others. So uh, this is from one of the state-of-the-art ones at MIT. And if you say, what is this person holding? Its top guess is a phone. Then it sort of says, you know, from what it looks like, they could be scissors or it could be a, a bat. Uh, and then it kind of puts together what's in the words, what's in the things, and it, get, it gets it right. That's pretty cool. Uh, if, you go, if you show it this picture and say, what is the person holding? Well, you as a human sort of look at that and, and sort of say, wait a minute, what? But the computer is sort of, well, you know, I see things in here that a human could hold. So that's not so bad. So it actually came up with a remote pen camera. So that's not too bad. But, but of course, if I give it this picture, and say, what is the person holding? It says ski poles, a surfboard, a bat. Now we're pretty sure this thing isn't doing real well. right? We still need those humans to help. Set. So the real problem is context. right? If I show it lots of pictures of people holding things and say, what is the person holding? It does great. If I show it lots of arbitrary pictures and say, find me pictures of someone holding something, it's not really good at that or, or what is being held. So, so background knowledge is starting to creep in, which is good. This problem. So, so another example of this is uh, I was showing a picture of a lot of uh, different, different animals saying, what are the cows eating? And it always came up with either grass or hay. And I was showing pictures of elephants, and I was showing pictures of ostriches. And then I threw in a picture of an airplane and said, you know, what are the cows eating? And it said, grass. You know, I mean, again, so, so it, it's a good inference if you don't know anything about the image to say what cows are eating is probably grass, but it wasn't really. So, so the linking of these two hasn't been as strong as people want in the question answering, but in the, in the labeling descriptions of what's going on, this is very promising. And so there are a lot of people now, still mostly in the research community, although some of this is starting to translate into actual product space, who are looking at sort of semi-automated annotation or things like that. So imagine you could run this across a bunch of stuff and you're getting things like a woman shredding chicken in a kitchen. Right, and, and these, you're not asking a question, so that context picture problem goes away. It's not always right, but if you showed it like a set of these images, what it does is it kind of learns over time that there should be some continuity. So if the first one you think is a woman shredding uh, chicken, and the second one is an ostrich eating something else, and the third one is a woman shredding chicken, then probably that whole thing was the, the, the the chicken stuff, and, and you know, the ostrich was probably just a bad guess about that one frame, things like that. So this is really promising. So one of the things we see coming out of modern AI is some stuff that might help us with this annotation problem. Okay, the second one, this is something one of my colleagues has just started doing, and I'm just totally excited by it. Um, so she spent a lot of her career working on games and nar narratives. And sort of how do you take what's going on in a game and make it interesting for someone? And, and this is sort of the, the base technology of a lot of these games which have AI characters in them. And those are getting really powerful. I mean, if you've played any of these games, the, the things you're interacting with, you know, they're, you know they're not other people, but sometimes they sure seem, you know, eerily so. In fact, there's a lot of them in chat groups and stuff, well, Twitter bots, right? Uh, we mentioned the election. We're not going to go there today. but. A whole bunch of stuff happening was things that weren't actually people claiming to be people to push various things. And one party was much better at it this time than the other. Um, but, but she said, why don't we take that kind of, so, so we were talking to the librarians. And she sort of said, why don't we take the stuff that's in the library where you have all that metadata and use this storytelling technology to let people integrate with it. And she noticed there was a lot of, um, geodata in there, so where things were taking place, so you can put that on maps. We have these networks I was showing you of things that link together, and then of course you have the, the things that are in the archive. So what happens is it starts putting together a little story, and it's still early days, but so this is some pictures of a building on our campus, and, it's, and there's some pictures in the archive of a fire about it, and it started telling the story of that. And so here are some of the people who were involved, and it will actually tell you sort of where we're going, so, and, and so it allows a, 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 
allows you to interrupt and uh, start exploring at any point. So you sort of say, I'm interested in this building. It says, okay, let me tell you a little bit about the history of this building and some of the people involved. And you say, oh, I'm more interested in people, so it'll take you down the people path. And you say, oh, I'm really interested in the architecture. It kind of takes you down the architecture path. You do it by mostly interacting with it. We're also exploring some novel interaction technologies. So this is that same thing when you put it in, in your holodeck-like uh, thing. So that's, that's real. That's a real photo. That's not like... So we're actually working on multiple people in these kind of large contexts with AI systems that are listening to what they're doing, letting them interact, things like that. So this is a big project at RPI, and I'm going to stop there. But again, so, so imagine now that your, your, your video archives are feeding into rooms like this where people, instead of going to see a movie, are going to sort of, in a sense, create from your archives or from your sets of things as it were, their own movie or their own sets of things. Tell me the story. So, so I want to know, I want to I wanna kind of see a biopic of this person that no one made a biopic of, but there are lots of pieces around that could be constructed through this kind of technology. So again, so the other thing people are looking at now is the realization that we don't just have to be marking up this stuff for the sake of getting better answers, finding things, but also for reusing it in new and novel ways, which may give a different value proposition whether it's helping people explore what's in your archive, whether it's helping people create these personal things in some kind of, so again, you know, this might be a, a if you've gone to any of these um, uh, discovery rooms, the, the, you know, you go in and they're saying, you know, you gotta find your way out of this room and it's ancient Egypt and things like that. This would be sort of doing that kind of in the wild against huge amounts of stuff in the background. So very, very early days, but I'm just, as you can see, I'm really excited about this. So I decided I wouldn't give the whole talk on this today, but I would mention it at the end. So anyway, so to finish up, right, just to summarize what I've been saying. So this semantic web and the term linked data started to get used, and now the term knowledge graph is becoming used even more. It's been a small but growing presence in the archiving world. Now, it's become heavily used these days in the library and museum communities for describing the collection. One of the problems is the British Museum uses this, some other museum uses that, uh, Stanford Library uses this, and when you want to start linking them together, how do you reconcile? How do you figure out what are the same, which are the same things and stuff like that? But again, that's what Google's been doing at the back end. The tools for that exist. The real problem has been finding someone who can figure out the business model of why museum share, you know, who's going to pay for museum sharing. A uh, lot more interest, though, in collection management and in collection sharing that may cause that, that investment to be there. So most of collection management has been internal. Now you're suddenly talking about, again, that I'm calling you up and saying, hey, we just had a triple play. You ever got any video of one of those? Right? And, you know, that wasn't a term you used to index your stuff. How are we going to find them fast? Um, these semantic technologies are being deployed at scale in the larger web world, primarily for search and social networking, primarily driven by ad match, which, by the way, is another good way to make money. And I know a lot of people in collection management are very interested in how do I make it so, A, the video you're looking at can become sort of a living advertisement, or B, the opposite side of that, how can I sort of help people in building advertisements. IBM has done some cool stuff with taking a whole lot of video archives, running it through these learning algorithms, feeding it into the Watson program, and now you sit down to say, I want to make a commercial to sell so-and-so, and says, okay, here's some pieces you might want to put together, and here's who has them, and how much it's going to cost, right? That kind of thing. So again, still early days, but really starting to happen. And then, as I mentioned, these new AI technologies may have the potential to overcome some of these key problems, reducing the cost of metadata, metadata generation annotation. And the one I'm really excited about is making archives sort of alive and explorable. So I'll stop there. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to start off uh, with a question. How did I know he would? Dr. Hendler. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. I'm here, folks. Um, we have in the room today, and, and you, one of your first slides showed many of the different digital asset management, media asset management, production asset management platforms that are out there, and there are probably hundreds. 
And we have several of the, the, the developers of several of these platforms in the room with us today. Thank you, sponsors. And yet, very few of these platforms, as you said, support these semantic web approaches. Uh, first of all, why do you think that is? And what's going to compel vendors to embed these capabilities in the product? Because it strikes me that it probably has to begin with them to a degree. Yes. So, um, well, normally I repeat the question, but I think since he was using a mic, you probably heard it. But again, why, what's going what's to motivate those of you who build tools to pay attention to what I just said? Okay, and I, and I think there's a couple things. One is those things I put at the end, which is that there may be some new technology to break through, but that, that's, that's a little forward looking. What about today? And I think the answer is, again, it gets down to that economic model. Why am I doing it? If I'm making my money by selling the tool, my focus is on, on locking you into my tool. Sorry, I, uh, I can say that much nicer. If my tool is the best one that's out there, I really want to encourage you to use my tool, right? Uh, and and <laughs> got to remember what audience I'm in, yes. Anyway, no, seriously, I mean, you know, it, it's, not, it's not done in a negative way, it's done in a positive way. You really are competing. And part of that competition is if you're using my tool, you know, then, then it's going to cost you double to use the next tool and the next tool and the next tool. So if we look at the early days of the World Wide Web, and I'm, I'm old enough and lucky enough to have been involved in that, uh, you know, while you were using that modem, we were, we were, <laughs> we were past Archie and Gopher. Um, the, the same question kept getting asked. What's the value proposition of stuff? And the good news with the web was that it was relatively free, and a lot of people kind of said, hey, it would be cool to share pictures of this thing I like. Maybe someone will come look at them. And so it, it started growing fairly organically, partly because nobody ever thought they'd make any money off of this thing, right? Every single vendor would come in and say, Tah! right? And, and the good news is the guy who invented it said, okay, we'll just give it away, right? If we don't get a lot of people using it, no one will make money off of it. So one of the things is there wasn't an existing market and it got to spread virally. Um, and so I think one of the things is sort of what are the economic models that say share. Now, what interestingly happened in the web world because it grew up that way, and this is something that I've heard about in talking to your, some of the people just here in the morning. So a lot of people are talking about metadata standards because you want to share, right? So each tool will support the same metadata standards so they can export to each other because we're starting to see a market for exactly getting stuff from somewhere else, knowing what's there, not just my own collection with my own tools. So, so what happens at the, in the web was the vendors who were competing with each other realized there were certain things that if they, they, they should cooperate on, so they would compete in sort of the browser space, but if, the, but, if, but if the Microsoft browser could only look at things that were built for the Microsoft browser and the, and the uh, then Netscape browser could only look at Netscape and some of these smaller browsers could only, then, then in fact you wouldn't get the, this growth that we knew. So we wanted everybody to sort of share the HTML as it was back then, or now these much more complex languages, and let the browsers compete over what features they offer and things like that. So as things start to be shared, as you need these cross infrastructures, these kind of metadata standards become more important. The problem is we're still thinking about metadata mostly in an old way, which says, let's get the whole thing standardized, right? Let's make sure everybody agrees on every term. And that's really what motivated a lot of semantic web. I'm going to do one more digression in answering this question. But I actually, um, part of what made this happen, part of why I got involved in this was I had been playing with these technologies. But I got asked to come be a program manager at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, which is sort of the biggest investor in the US at that point in uh, basic research and applied research in computing, right? And, and I sort of was pitching some of this stuff there uh, because it there was a really big problem we had in the military, which is every, so, so if you look at an airplane, a military airplane, on, on its tail is something called a tail number, and it's two letters, a hyphen, and, and either three or four, actually two to four numbers nowadays, right? AF-617. In the databases of the military, somebody had published just a few years earlier, they had 14 different representations in the different databases for this thing, right? And everybody was trying to solve the problem again and again by saying, let's just standardize. And so, so I kind of came in with this web kind of notion and said, okay, it's clearly not working, 
right? So every general came in and said, oh, the last guy just didn't do it right, right? If he had just been a, been a little more forceful, everyone would have gotten together and done the right thing. And I started saying, why didn't it work? So I actually went to different pieces of the community. So I went to the guys who, who were the air control officers, these guys who send it, you know, airplanes into battle. And uh, so what's the most important part of the airplane? And their answer was unambiguous. They all said the same thing, the munitions load. Because to them, an airplane is a truck that takes a particular thing to a place and does something. Okay? You go to the guys who, who, who maintain the planes, the logistics base, say, what's the most important part? You never hear munitions load. So you say, what about the munitions load? They say, that's not part of an airplane. Right? Guy comes to my, air, my base and he's still got his munitions load. I gotta close down the damn base, right? I mean, that, we don't want munitions in our... So, so they had different conceptual models of the same thing and database technology does not encourage... So, so if, I want, if I want to have something very similar to yours and only add a couple of pieces to it, I, I may as well build my own because I'm gonna have to write some code to map things between them. Whereas this web technology gave you a way to say, let me just extend what's here with something over here. And that didn't make it into the data world and now is. So that's a, a big piece of this knowledge graph. So I think what I'd say to you who are vendors is to start thinking about getting these vocabularies, getting these descriptors out there. Don't worry so much about getting the metadata to agree. Worry about it. Being there, being accessible, and being ex externally nameable in this URI technique is one way of doing it. It's not the only one. Now what happens is someone else coming along can say, oh, you know, I see what you're doing and I see what here's doing. Let me build some mapping in there. So now third parties can help you share. And then there, that can happen in a consortium, that can happen in a competitive space, that can happen in a lot of different places. But it's really the realizing the value of the sharing, right? Is, is gonna make everybody's tool more popular, everybody's tool more valuable, and, and therefore, instead of competing for pieces of the market, you continue competing for pieces of the market at the back end, market. but share and grow a new market and, and raise all the boats and all those. Metaphors. All right, we're gonna sorry, have long, to long keep answer, sorry. a couple yeah. more questions fairly on the brief side, especially in terms of the responses. Jim. Yeah, I'm, um, really, I'm really bad at so fast. We have Laura, Laura's laughing. She's known me a long time. A couple of mic people. Um, so if, uh, I, I saw a few hands. Uh, yeah, we'll start with you, Bob. Hi, I'm just be curious. What is your process and cost for doing semantic indexing? Because that might be a, a barrier for application developers to incorporate it into their applications. So um, it's a really hard question to answer because it's a pretty growing technology. But most of it runs, uh, so, so if you can pre-process and run a lot of it in, in sort of batches, and again, I, I, I didn't talk much about it, then most of that now can be done on cloud for a relatively so short cost, things like that. The real cost is at the moment is still finding someone who knows how to do it, who can really, so, so it's not like you just sort of open up this thing called TensorFlow and you stick a few things in and you run it real easily. It, it requires, a lot of fooling around to get it to work very well, and there's trade-offs and things like that. So as people are training up on this now, we're getting better. Um, so the cost is coming down, but the marginal cost at the moment is primarily in getting the annotation in there and feeding it to these search tools, not so much in the actual running of the, the tools. And, and again, I think you're starting to see a lot of startups in this space, there's going to be a lot of competition over the next few years. People and doing a this session and to today cost. by two of those entrepreneurs. I'll just add. And, and in fact, to today, some things <laughs> here. <laughs> All right, there was another I question. I promise to keep it short. There, Christy. That may or may not work. Hello, there I am. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm wondering. Oh, and by the way, everyone, please introduce yourselves. Again, we're, we're a community here. There will be some sessions to meet and greet and afterwards, of course. So please tell us who you are, Christy. I am Christy King, but you knew that. And probably maybe two other people in this room knew that. <laughs> uh, my question, or I guess it's sort of a half question, half observation is, in watching this and thinking about um, data visualization applications, I'm wondering if Maybe the bigger problem here is that we're not thinking about giving people a better way to ask questions, meaning instead of just sticking two or three search terms into our dams or into our search engines, really it strikes me, especially based on what you're saying, is if I give the system context, it can give me a more contextual answer. 
So I'm wondering if people are spending some time on, maybe I should phrase it as the algorithm of the question as opposed to the answer. He said I have to give short answers. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I wrote a book about that. No, I mean, that actually, so, so what's really at the heart of a lot of this is con that, that word context is so important to this. And a lot of people are exploring question answering technologies, things like that. I have a big new project trying to do some of this in the medical space. And, and one of the issues, if you and I both go to Google and type in a blood sugar number, we're likely to find the same pages, right? Yet probably that number means very different things to, to the two of us, because uh, looking at you, you're not an overweight guy who's you know, got high propensity to develop diabetes. So, so a number that might be really bad for you might be really good for me. How do we get that context? How do we get that other information in there at the right time in the right place? So, so suffice to say that a lot of these AI companies now that do language and question answering things like that are really trying to figure out, the, the tradition has been, so build the system narrowly so you know what the questions are about, right? If I know you're gonna ask questions only about telephone manuals, then I can put in a whole lot of information about telephone manuals and I can do a great job of answering questions about, Menus. The real breakthrough on that was 2011, the, um, uh, the Jeopardy playing IBM Watson. They really had to answer questions about whatever the hell got thrown at it. And again, they were simple answers and things like that. So it had to come up with a different way of, of kind of hitting that context stuff. And again, I teach a whole course on that, so I'll stop there to say, a lot of people are asking the question you just asked, and it's driving a lot of the research. But when you're within these contexts already, that can help you a lot. Or you can sort of give people an interface that doesn't really let them ask arbitrary search questions, but pushes them towards the stuff you're trying to show them. And that's what a lot of people are now playing with in the commercial space here. <laughs>